thank you all for coming. So my name is Michael Kearns. Um, and yeah, so this talk is about a book that I wrote with a close friend and colleague at Penn, Aaron Roth. Uh, both of us are kind of card-carrying career researchers in AI generally, but specifically in machine learning. Really more on the algorithm design side, um, sort of thinking about what the right core algorithms are and what the principles underlying those algorithms are. We do a fair amount of experimental research as well. Um, and, um, you know, many people in my field have kind of watched with some combination of surprise and alarm at the developments of the last 10 years or so when, you know, the field that I've been working in for many decades went from kind of a relatively obscure corner of computer science to permeating all of society with algorithms and particularly algorithms that are the result of a learning process, machine learning. Um, really making very, very consequential decisions about the lives of ordinary individuals. So just to make things very concrete here, I'm talking about things like algorithms or predictive models, deciding things like whether you get a loan or not, whether you are admitted to your, the college of your choice, HR departments using these models to screen resumes, judges using risk assessment models to decide whether an incarcerated individual should get parole or not, or what sentence they should receive in the first place. Okay? And so we've kind of in a relatively short period of time, primarily due to the rise of the consumer internet, which has allowed all of us the opportunity to provide incredibly granular data about our movements, our interests, our fears, our hopes, our medical records, what we're Googling, et cetera. Um, to, to kind of move from making, you know, aggregate decisions about scientific systems like weather prediction or the directional movement of the stock market to really making very, very personalized decisions about you. And, and so machine learning has experienced a lot of amazing success in the last 20 years or so, and I would kind of crudely characterize what's happened in the last 10 years, at least from kind of a mainstream media standpoint, as, you know, 2010 to 2015, there was this rush of excitement as you know, deep learning and related technologies made serious inroads into long-standing core technologies like speech recognition and image processing and the like. And the last five years or so have been a little bit more of a buzz kill as we've realized that those same systems and models can essentially engage in violations of privacy in a systematic way or result in algorithmic decision making that is discriminatory against racial, gender, or other groups. Okay? And so, you know, um, these days it's difficult to pick up mainstream media publications and not find at least one article a day on these kinds of phenomena. There was, many of you may have seen this one just last week in Science Magazine that got a lot of attention where a model for predictive health care was systematically discriminating against black people. Um, and, and so why did we decide to write this book? So, you know, there are a number of good books before us, three of which I've shown here, um, that we admire, that we think do a very good job at, uh, to a lay audience describing what the problems are. Um, but we felt like they were a little bit short on solutions, right? So these books all do a very good job at pointing out the ways in which machine learning can violate um, individual privacy or notions of fairness in prediction. Um, but when you get to like, well, what should we do about all this in these books, they all have a section that discusses this usually towards the end. Their answers are basically, well, we need better laws, we need better regulations, we need better watchdog groups, we really have to keep an eye on this stuff. And you know, we agree with all of that, but we also think that there are things that can be done at a technical level. In particular, if algorithmic misbehavior is largely the problem, we could think about making the algorithms better in the first place, better in the social sense, like not engaging in discriminatory behavior, leaks of private data, and the like. And we're not proposing these types of algorithmic solutions to algorithmic pr problems to the exclusivity of these institutional solutions. It's just we think this is what we know about, first of all. We're computer scientists. We're not policymakers, social workers, or legal scholars. And we also think this can be done right now, right? You know, institutional change, laws, regulations, that takes a lot of time. Companies like Google, Facebook, what have you, can make their algorithms better right now, and they actually know how to do it, okay? 
And so we are part of a growing you know, kind of sub-community of the machine learning community that are taking these ideas seriously and thinking about you know, literally in the code of these algorithms, putting in conditions that prevent different types of antisocial behavior. And we thought that there was enough literature on this topic now and that it was interesting and important enough that we would write a general audience book trying to just explain what that underlying science looks like, what its promise is, and also what its, what its limitations are. So we think it's, in the one sense, it is a technologically optimistic book. We are technological optimists. We're not technological utopianists. Um, but we try to do a balanced job of sort of saying, this is what we know how to do now. This is what we don't know how to do now. This is what we think we'll know how to do 10 years from now. And these are some things that we think algorithms should never do. Okay, And so that, that's what the book is about. Um, some people, when they hear the title of the book, they think it's kind of a conundrum or um, almost a contradiction. Um, so we've had the reaction before, like ethical algorithms. Um, you know, isn't that like asking, you know, isn't that like discussing ethical hammers? Because after all, a hammer is a tool designed by human beings for a particular purpose. Um, and anything unethical or ethical about the use of a hammer, you can kind of directly attribute to whoever wields the hammer. So even though a hammer is designed for building stuff and pounding nails and all that good stuff, you know, I could hit you on the hand with the hammer. And we might consider that an unethical use of this tool. But nobody would sort of say, well, the hammer was unethical, right? You would ascribe it to the human designer. I mean, you would describe it to the user of that tool, not to the tool itself. So we actually argue that algorithms are actually different. Yes, algorithms are human-designed artifacts and tools to solve specific problems. But especially the modern nature of algorithmic decision making when it's acting on particular individuals has a different moral character. And a moral character that cannot be ascribed to the designer or the user of that algorithm. And at a high level, what I mean by that is, you know, the way algorithmic decision making is done these days is usually not by explicit programming. So if I am a large institutional lender and I am trying to build a model to decide who to give mortgages or not, depending on the data that's in your mortgage application, and by the way, maybe a lot of other data about you that I got from somewhere else, like your social media activity, okay? And, that, and this is a thing, if you didn't know it, to not just use the information on your application, but to use any other data that I can buy about you to make that decision. So, you know, instead of a human being sort of sitting down and thinking like, okay, based on all these different variables I know about you, what should the rule be about who gets a loan or doesn't get a loan? That's not how it works. It's all done with machine learning. So I take a large, perhaps very high dimensional, complicated data set um, describing previous loan applications that let's say I did grant a loan to and then an indication about whether you repaid the loan or not. And this is my training data. I have these XY pairs. X are like is all the stuff I know about you. Y is whether you repaid the loan or not. And I want to you know, use machine learning to, to learn a model to predict that. And that's what I'm going to use for making my decisions. So this, this complicated data set gets turned into some complicated you know, objective function or landscape in which I'm trying to you know, maximize some mathematically well-defined objective, which typically, almost exclusively these days, has to do with predictive accuracy. So I say, find the neural network on this historical lending data set that minimizes the number of mis uh, mistakes of prediction made, meaning people that the model would have denied the loan to that would have repaid the loan, or people that the model gave the loan to that didn't repay. Okay? And so you go from the data to this objective function. The objective function is used to search through some complicated space of models, like a deep neural network, for those of you that know that, what that means, but it doesn't really matter. And, and then it's that model that gets deployed. right? And even though every step of this process is scientific, and the machine learning scientist entirely understands that OK, what we're going to do is use the data to define this objective and then search through some space of models for the model that best meets that objective. You know, that human designer isn't going to be able to tell you what this model will do on any particular input. So if you ask the model, like, hey, 
here's a loan application. Do you think the model will give them a loan or not? The human designer isn't going to be able to say, oh, yeah, because I wrote the code, I know that they'll get the loan or that they won't because on line 17 of the program, you know, they haven't been in their current job long enough. The designer is going to say, I don't know, like run the model on it and we'll find out whether they get a loan or not. And you know, maybe more to the point, if, if you ask the question to the designer, well, is it possible that this model that you built systematically rejects the loans of creditworthy black applicants compared to creditworthy white applicants? Again, the answer will be like, I, I don't know. Why don't we try it and see? Okay? Or is it possible that just even you know, releasing the details of this model or even using it in the field might leak the private information about the individuals used to train the model? Again, the answer would be, I don't know. Okay? Because I sort of oversaw this pipeline, but I didn't, un I didn't you know, specifically engage in the automated optimization of this objective function defined by a very large complicated data set. Okay? And so in this way, even though hammers and algorithms are both human designed artifacts for specific purposes, you know, algorithms are quite different from a moral and ethical standpoint in that you know, any ethical misbehaviors about these algorithms are quite removed from the individual who oversaw this process. And also their flexibility of purpose, right? You know, a hammer is kind of designed you know, under normal circumstances to do exactly one thing very well that everybody completely understands. An algorithm is much more complicated and has much greater flexibility of purpose. And so it's much harder to assign blame to any part of this pipeline or to understand what the consequences will be. So in our book, what we try to argue is that um, one important component of the solutions to these problems, in addition to the ones I mentioned before that are more about kind of social change or institutional change, is that we need to embed social values that we care about directly into the code of our algorithms. And you know, if there's sort of one takeaway from our book, it's that we're here to tell you that that is scientifically possible. Um, not in all cases, and there will also be costs and trade-offs that I'll talk about a little bit. But the road is clear to making our algorithms better than they are today. I didn't say perfect, but better than they are today. And so if you're going to tell an algorithm how to avoid violations of privacy or of fairness or other social norms like that you might care about, like accountability or interpretability, the first step is not to sort of go write computer code. It's to think extremely hard about definitions. Because if I'm going to tell an algorithm, you know, the thing about algorithms is that you can't leave anything uncertain. You can't sort of say like, well, you know, um, you know, make sure that you're not unfair to this population. You need to really say like, what does unfair mean? And how do you measure an unfairness? And how much, how much unfairness is too much? Okay. And so one of the interesting exercises about this kind of you know, scientific research is that even though scholars and you know, practitioners um, many centuries or even eons before people like me came along have thought very deeply about things like fairness, for instance. So, you know, computer scientists are late to the study of fairness. <laughs> Philosophers, economists, um, uh, social scientists, all of them have thought much longer and more deeply about fairness than computer scientists. But what's different is that they never had to think about it in so precise a way that you could tell it to a computer program. And sometimes there's great virtue in just that rigor by itself, even if you don't go on and do anything with it. Because sometimes thinking that precisely about, what you, about definitions exposes flaws in your thinking that were only going to be exposed by being that precise. And I'll give concrete examples um, as we go. Um, so the basic you know, kind of research agenda that Aaron and I and our students and many others in the machine learning community have been engaged in, in the past few years is kind of going through this process of thinking about different social properties or ethical properties we would like from our algorithms, thinking hard about what the right definition or as it might be definitions should be, and then thinking about how do you implement them in an algorithm, and then what is the cost to other things that you might care about. So, to preview one big message of our book. Um, nobody should expect that by asking for fairness from an algorithm 
or, ac or, or privacy from an algorithm that you won't degrade its accuracy. Because, you know, it's an additional constraint. If the optimal model ignoring fairness for making loans accurately happens to be discriminatory against some minority, then eradicating that discrimination by definition is going to make the error worse. Okay? Um, and so there are going to be like real costs. There are going to be monetary costs for the company that adopt the solutions that we suggest and hard decisions to be made about how much to adopt them in exchange for how much profitability, for example. And so our, our book, you know, you've noticed I've written down a number of social norms here in increasing kind of um, in different levels of grayscale. And, and the grayscale is basically representing how much scientific progress we've made on the algorithmic study of these different social norms. So I think our opinion is that um, notions of data privacy or algorithmic privacy are on the firmest scientific foundations right now. And that the feeling is that we've settled on kind of the right definition on the one hand, and we have made a fair amount of, of progress at algorithmically implementing that definition. Fairness has quite a bit of progress, but we'll see is we already know it's going to, it's not just messier right now, it's going to be messier period going forward in the sense that we're going to have to multiple, entertain multiple competing definitions of fairness. Other social norms that you might have heard about are accountability or interpretability or even morality in algorithms. And it, we don't think that any of these are less interesting or less important, but we put them in a lighter shade because less is known about them. And you know, I promise you that the singularity is written down there, but you can't see it because um, it's it's so light. Okay. Um, okay. So let me. So what I want to do with my time is kind of give you a flavor of what this research agenda looks like and where you know where the science is right now. Um, for the areas of privacy and for fairness. Um, and then just very briefly at the end, you know, kind of talk about um, some other topics that are in the book. So let's talk about data privacy for a second, okay? And, um, and, and to sort of highlight this point that I made about sometimes thinking very precisely about definitions, helping you expose your, the flaws in your own intuitions about these topics. Let me start by picking on the notion of anonymization of data, okay? which unfortunately is by an extremely wide margin the prevailing definition of privacy that is used in practice in industry. So any tech company whose services you use that has some privacy policy statement um, is almost certainly using a privacy definition that is some form of data anonymization. Okay? And I'm here to deliver the unfortunate news that not only are those definitions kind of flawed technically, they're fundamentally flawed conceptually. They cannot be fixed. It's a waste of time. Okay? And let me, let me tell you why. Okay? So let's imagine. Um, so, so what does anonymization, first of all, mean? Anonymization basically means taking an original data set, like this little toy example, this table, the top one for just, for just right now, and redacting certain columns from it or coarsening certain columns in order to kind of reduce the resolution of the data. So another term that's used that sounds fancier but is basically the same is removing PII, personally identifiable information. So here's a hypothetical you know, medical record database of a hospital um, in which they've decided sensibly, like, look, you know, if we're going to release this data for scientific research, which is something, by the way, that we'd all like them to do, like scientific research is one of the better uses of things like machine learning these days, we're not going to include people's names. We're just going to redact that column entirely. And to kind of reduce the granularity of the data, I'm not going to like specify people's exact age and years. I will just group them into, de into decades. I'll say whether you're 20 to 30, 30 to 40, et cetera. I won't put your full zip code in, but I'll put the first three digits so researchers have some idea of where you live. And then maybe I you know, include some medical fields without coarsening or redaction. Okay? And what is the goal of this kind of anonymization? Well, you know, the primary goal is that um, you know, if I go, if if I had a neighbor, let's say, that um, that I, you know, because she's my neighbor, I know what her name is, and I know her age, and maybe I know or suspect that she's been a patient at this particular hospital. 
that I shouldn't be able to identify her medical record from that information. Okay, and so in particular, if I have a neighbor and her name is Rebecca and I know she's 55 years old and I know she's female, um, you know, because of this redaction and coarsening in this top database, I go and look at this database and there are two records that match the information I know about Rebecca, um, these two that are highlighted in red. And you know, the idea is that um, if there are enough matches after the redaction and the coarsening, I will not really be able to pick out Rebecca's medical record and she should somehow feel reassured by this. Now, of course, in this toy example, you can see I've already learned from this that she's either HIV positive or has colitis. And Rebecca might prefer that I not know that she has one of those or the other. But you could imagine like, well, in a real database, there'd be tens of thousands of these records. And if I did enough of this coarsening and redaction, maybe there would be like 100 different medical records that matched Rebecca. And now I really wouldn't be able to glean much information about her true medical status at all. OK? OK. The problem is, suppose there's like a second data set that has also been coarsened and redacted for exactly the same purposes. And I also happen to know or suspect, because it's another local hospital, that you know, Rebecca might have been treated or seen there as well. And so I go to the second database and I say, like, OK, 55-year-old um, females, how many of them are on the data set? And this time there are three matches after the coarsening and redaction. But when I do the join of these two databases, when I take the, the red records from the top database and the bottom database, I now uniquely know that my neighbor is HIV positive. Okay? And you, know, you might again sort of argue like, oh, but if the data sets are big enough and I do enough of this coarsening, um, you know, the idea is just broken. And what's fundamentally broken about notions of anonymization is, you know, and, and this is kind of a technical consequence of this flaw, they pretend like the data set that's in front of you is the only data set that is ever going to exist in the world. And that there are no auxiliary sources of information or additional databases that you can combine to try to triangulate and re-identify people. Okay, and lest you think that, oh, is this a real problem? It's a real problem. Many of the biggest breaches of private data other than the ones that are just due to like cryptographic hacks, are exactly due to this kind of re-identification or sometimes called linkage analysis, in which I take you know, the allegedly anonymized database, but then I combine it with even publicly available information about individuals, and then I'm able to figure out, like, OK, this allegedly anonymized individual in the database is this particular real-world individual. And this happens all the time. Okay. So this is an example where like, thinking hard about a definition will cause you to conclude that there's something kind of irretrievably bad about this particular one. And so you might say, like, OK, well, what's your better idea? Okay? And so again, to sort of demonstrate the value of thinking in a very precise way, <laughs> let me propose you know, what I think we could all agree, at least in my English description of it, is the strongest, most desirable definition of individual data privacy that we could possibly propose, which would go something like this. Suppose I promised you that any analysis or computation that involved you know, your private data, um, that, that no harm could come to you as a consequence of that computation or analysis. So again, you can write this down mathematically, but I think the the spirit of it is clear from the English. Just like any computation that involves your private data cannot result in any harm to you, no matter what happens in the future, including new data sets becoming available that we didn't foresee at the time of this computation. Okay? So I want to argue that this is asking too much. It'd be great if we could do it, but it's asking too much in the sense that if we enforce this definition of privacy, we'll never be able to do anything useful with data. OK, so here's the example. This is the front page of a famous paper from the 1950s. So suppose it's 1950 and you are a smoker. And if it's 1950, you are a smoker, because in 1950, everybody is a smoker. Because you know, there's no known health risks of smoking. There's no social stigma associated with smoking. It's seen as glamorous and fashionable, and everybody does it. Okay. And suppose you're asked like, you know, by some medical researchers, hey, would you be willing to let your medical record be included in a study about the potential harmful effects of smoking? And you say, sure. Okay? And so this study is then done. And this study 
you know, firmly establishes the correlation between smoking and lung cancer, okay? And your data was part of that study, and you're a smoker, okay? We can, we can argue that real harm was caused to you as a result of this study, because now the world knows that smoking and lung cancer are correlated, and if we want to make these harms concrete, since you didn't hide the fact that you were a smoker from anyone, including your health insurer, and they know that you're a smoker, and now they know this fact about smoking and lung cancer, they might raise your premiums. And so, like, among other things, literal financial harm has come to you as a result of this study. Okay, so if we adopt the definition of privacy that I suggested, we, wouldn't, we would uh, disallow this kind of scientific study, which I think we can all agree is a good, kind of, is a good type of study. So here's a slight, mo here's, but here's an observation about this study and this definition, which is that actually the inclusion of your specific idiosyncratic medical record in this study was in no way necessary to establish the link between smoking and lung cancer. Because the link between smoking and lung cancer is a fact about the world that can be reliably established with any sufficiently large database of medical records. It wasn't like your medical records inclusion was like the key piece of data that, that really nailed the correlation, right? As long as they had enough data of smokers and non-smokers and their medical history, they were gonna learn this correlation, okay? So this leads us to a slight modification of the definition that I gave that I'm claiming is too strong, which is instead of saying no computation that involved your data should create any harm for you, we'll say no harm should be created that wasn't going to be created if the same computation was done with only your data set removed, okay? So this is what's called differential privacy, which was introduced in roughly 2005. And so the thought experiment here isn't like, well, your data was included, does harm come to you or not? It's like we start with a database of N medical records, and yours is one of the N medical records in this individual, you are Xavier, or the medical record in the file folder in red, okay? And we, we, we perform two thought experiments. We say like, well, look, suppose we perform this computation or study or analysis using all the medical records, okay? And then the, the counterfactual is that we consider the same computation or analysis done with n minus one medical records where the minus one is we remove yours. So if the harm that comes to you, if, if the harms that can come to you downstream from including your medical record in the N and disincluding it in the N minus one are basically the same, then we're gonna call that privacy. And the only harms we're gonna protect are the ones where the harm really came from the inclusion of your data set versus the other N minus one, okay? So notice this definition allows the smoking study. Right, because you were a smoker, yeah, but there were lots of smokers in the data set. The same conclusion was gonna be reached if it was removed. But any harm that really relied on your particular data, that's going to be disallowed by this definition of privacy. And this is called differential privacy. Differential privacy um, basically acts by adding noise to computation. So it turns out when you kind of think about this, in order to get, you know, when, when you get into the, under the hood of differential privacy, it really requires that algorithms be randomized or probabilistic, that they flip coins during the computation. And so let me describe um, one of the earliest um, industry deployments of differential privacy, um, which was done by Apple. Um, and they were apparently so excited about this that a company that we normally associate with good design taste decided to do this incredibly tacky thing of like renting out the side of a of Best Western or Residence Inn in Las Vegas and, and put this big <laughs> ad for themselves on the side. Um, but but what, so what do they do? So um, if you are a user of a recent or later model iPhone or iPad, one of the things your phone periodically does is report to the mothership um, of Apple um, information about your app usage, statistics about your app usage. So maybe on a weekly basis, it says, you know, how many hours did you, you know, um, look at your email? How many hours did you play Angry Birds, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Um, and so it has these app usage statistics. And um, rather, and, and you know, why is Apple interested in these app usage statistics? Well, 
you know, they claim they're not actually interested in your app usage statistics. They want to know aggregates. They want to know what are the most popular apps kind of platform-wide. And their developers, of course, their app developers are very interested in these popularity statistics as well. So rather than report your detailed app usage statistics, like you played Angry Birds for 7.2 hours, you, you know, read the Wall Street Journal for 2.1 hours, et cetera, they'll take that kind of histogram of your app usage and they will add a lot of noise to it. They'll basically add random positive or negative numbers to each of your different app usage statistics. So maybe you read the New York Times for 2.1 hours and it adds like, you know, plus five hours to that. And maybe it takes your 7.2 hours of Angry Bird usage and it subtracts 3.7 hours from that. It just adds noise all across the board. And it adds so much noise to this histogram that actually if I looked at these kind of post-randomized version of your, I really wouldn't learn much of anything at all about your actual app usage statistics because there's so much noise. But because this noise is kind of independent, as we would say, like it's zero mean, right? It's, it could be positive, it could be negative, and it's sort of symmetrically distributed around zero. If I have 100 million users, and I get 100 million noisy reports like this, and I add them together, I get extremely accurate estimates of aggregate usage without compromising any individual's privacy. So this is like the, the core concept behind differential privacy. And where it gets interesting is where you want to make much more complicated uh, computations or analyses differentially private. The good news is that many of the most useful kinds of computations that we do these days, including pretty much everything in statistics and machine learning, can be made differentially private. So like the backpropagation algorithm for neural networks, which is kind of the core algorithm underlying deep learning technology, it is not differentially private. It does not give any privacy promises of any kind. There's a variant of it that in carefully chosen places adds carefully chosen types of noise that provably obeys this very strong definition of privacy. Now, you might say like, okay, great. So Apple has a way of protecting your app usage statistics. This seems like a rather low stakes application and I would agree with you. A, a big moonshot test for differential privacy is in the works. So the 2020 U.S. Census, by the way, the U.S. Census is constitutionally required to preserve privacy of individual data, but the U.S. Census has never before committed to a definition of privacy, so like, you know, it, it didn't really matter. You know, they, they kind of had very ad hoc anonymization style ways of implementing privacy in the past. This year, the, I mean, recently the U.S. Census has decided to bite the bullet and every single statistic or report that they issue from the underlying data of the 2020 Census will be done under the constraint of differential privacy. And when I say, so this, this, is, a big, this is a big endeavor, right, because there's a lot of engineering details to think about here. And in particular, one of the engineering details and kind of one of the themes of our book is this in, in this kind of adding noise to your app usage statistics, you know, there's, there's a knob we can turn here, right? I can add a little bit of noise to your app usage statistics, but then I'll be able to, people will be able to infer more about your app usage statistics. So like if you really played an extraordinary amount of Angry Birds this week and I only add a little bit of noise, I won't exactly know how much Angry Birds that you played, I'm gonna, but I'm gonna be able to look at this and say like, you're playing a lot of Angry Birds, okay? Um, so if I add a little bit of noise, I provide less privacy to you, but then the aggregate you know, will be more accurate, okay? Or I can add much, much more noise and then the aggregate will be less accurate. So there's a knob provided by differential privacy which lets you choose the trade-off between the promises you make to individuals about their level of privacy and the accuracy of the aggregate computations that you're doing. And so one, and differential privacy, by the way, is, is correctly silent on how you should set that knob because how you should set that knob should depend on what's at stake. Like maybe we don't really actually care that much about how much Apple knows about our usage statistics. And so we're, we're okay with relatively little noise being added. But maybe if it's our medical record or even our census data or our financial history, we want a lot more noise to be added. 
So differential privacy provides you a framework to manage this trade-off and think about it quantitatively, but it doesn't tell you how to set that knob. And sort of one of the big engineering details, of course, for the US Census is how to set that knob and how to set that knob on different computations. OK. So let me say a, a few words about, so this is a, all I'm going to talk about for now about, about privacy. But I hope this gives you some sense of you know, how thinking in this field goes, about good definitions and bad definitions, and about trade-offs between social norms like privacy and things like utility, profitability, and accuracy. So um, the study of algorithmic fairness, and more specifically fairness in machine learning, is in a much more nascent state than privacy, and in particular, differential privacy. Um, but we already know it's going to be a little bit messier than privacy, where I think many people who've thought deeply about privacy have kind of converged on differential privacy as the right core notion. Um, so there's not agreement on definitions in, in fairness. And in fact, it's even worse than that. Um, it is known that entirely reasonable definitions of fairness that each make sense in isolation are provably mathematically impossible to achieve simultaneously. Okay? And this was actually discovered through a controversy um, between a company that had developed a criminal risk assessment model used in sentencing decisions and a watchdog group that audited that model and pointed out the way a, a particular definition of fairness under which it was racially discriminatory, the company came back and said, like, well, we're very concerned about racial fairness. And we implemented racial fairness in our model. We used this definition of racial fairness. And there was some back and forth between these two parties. And then some more mathematically minded researchers in the community said, like, huh, I wonder if it's even mathematically possible to achieve these two things simultaneously. And they, they proved a theorem showing that it wasn't. So not only like the study of privacy will there be these trade-offs between fairness and accuracy, it's even worse than that. There might be trade-offs between different notions of fairness or even between different notions, the same notion of fairness in different groups. So in particular, there's no guarantee that if I build a like, predictive model for lending and make sure that it doesn't falsely reject black people more often than it falsely rejects white people, there's no guarantee that in the process of enforcing that fairness condition, I won't actually magnify gender discrimination. Okay? And that when, you know, to put it bluntly, something that we say kind of early and often in the book is that when machine learning is involved and you pick some objective function to optimize like error, you should never expect to get for free anything that you didn't explicitly state in the objective. And you shouldn't expect to avoid any behavior that you didn't specify should be explicitly avoided. right? Because if you're searching some complicated model space looking for the lower error, and there's some little corner of the model space where you can even incrementally, infinitesimally improve your error at the expense of some social norm, <coughs> machine learning is going to go for that corner because that's what it does. Okay? Um, but let me give you a, just a quick um, sort of visceral example of the ways in which machine learning can naturally engender unfairness or discrimination of various kinds. So let's suppose that we're a college admissions office and we're trying to develop a predictive model for collegiate success based on, let's say, just high school GPA on the x-axis and SAT score on the y-axis. So each little plus or minus here is a previous applicant to our college that we actually admitted. So we know whether they succeeded in college or not. Okay? And pick any quantitative definition of, of, of success in college that you want. Let's say it's you know graduate within five years of matriculating with at least a 3.0 GPA. It could be um, donates at least $10 million back to the college within 20 years of graduating. As long as we can measure it, I don't care what it is. Okay? And so each little point here um, you know, represents its x value is the GPA of that past admit. The y value is the SAT score of that past admit. But then the plus or minus is whether they succeeded or in college or not. Okay? And I'd like you to notice a couple of things about this population of individuals. Um, first of all, if you, looked at, if you stared at this carefully, you'd notice that, okay, that, that, um, that slightly less than half of the admits succeeded. 
there's slightly more than 50% minuses and slightly less than 50% pluses. Okay, that's observation number one. The other observation is that if I had to develop like a model or predict a model from this data, it's pretty clear that there's a pretty simple model that separates the pluses from the minus. If I draw this diagonal line and I say everybody whose combination of SAT score and GPA is above that line, I admit, and other ones, the other ones I reject, I would make very few mistakes on this data set. There's a couple, right? There's some false admits and there's some false rejects. But this simple model does a pretty good job of separating the successes from the non-successes, OK? OK, but suppose in my data set there's also a second population and that their data looks like this. And I want to make a couple points about this population. First of all, they are the minority. There's many fewer of these red points than there were of these orange points. Observation number two is that this population is slightly more qualified for college. There's an equal number of pluses here and minuses here in this minority population compared to the majority. Observation number three is that there's actually a perfect model separating for pluses and minuses here, which is this, this diagonal line. Okay. Now, though, if I train a model on the aggregate data, I've got both the reds and the oranges here now, and I say just maximize, minimize my, my predictive error on the combined data set, well, because the red points are such a small fraction of the data, I'm still going to end up choosing the model, which basically is the, the best model for the orange population, at the cost of rejecting every single qualified minority applicant. Okay. And you might ask, like, well, can this really happen in the real world? Well, so here's one story about why this might happen. The difference between the orange and the red population doesn't have to do with collegiate success. It basically is the case that the SAT scores of the minority population are kind of systematically shifted downward regardless of success or not. And one explanation for that could be that the orange population comes from a wealthy demographic in which you pay for SAT preparation courses and multiple retakes of the exam, all of which cost money. And the minority population can't afford any of that. And so even though they're no less prepared for college, they're less, less financially able to game this exam. And so they have systematically deflated SAT scores. Okay? Now, so, so this is how one, one of several ways in which just the natural optimization process of machine learning can result in visceral discrimination. You might, there's a number of things you might say about this. You might say like, well, why, you know, if I just look at this data, I would realize, look, it's not that they're less qualified, it's just that their SAT scores are lower and they're, they're very natural socioeconomic explanations for that. Why not just build two separate models? Why not use this model for the orange population and this model for the minority population? And in fact, by doing that, I would avoid this trade-off between accuracy and fairness, right? I would actually have a model that's both more fair and more accurate on both populations. The problem is many laws forbid the use of race, for example, in the, as an input to the model at all. And a model that says, like, well, if you're from this race, then use this line. And if you're from this race, use that line. That is a model that is using race as an input. It's like a decision tree that says, first look at the race and then branch right in one race and this way and another. So, so you know, a lot of laws that we have that are explicitly designed to protect some minority group can have the unintended effect of guaranteeing that we discriminate against that minority group if machine learning is the process by which we're developing our model. Okay. Now, notice that like differential privacy, where you could adjust the amount of noise, so, so, what, so what's a fix to this, right? So one fix to this would be to not enact laws that sort of forbid the use of making these observations and building different models if it increases fairness. Another thing I could do is instead of saying the objective is to minimize the error on the, on the combined data set, I could, I could basically specify a new objective that says the goal is to minimize the error subject to the constraint that the false rejection rates between the two populations can't be too different. Right? The false rejection rate on the red population of this model is 100%. Every plus, every red plus here is rejected. And the false rejection rate on the orange population is close to zero. Okay? So the most accurate model has the maximum possible unfairness. I could instead say, 
you can still have accuracy as an objective, but it, you have to find the line, for instance, that, that you have to find a single line that minimizes the error subject to the condition that the fraction of red pluses that you reject and the fraction of, of orange pluses that you reject have to be within 1% of each other or 5% of each other or 15% of each other. And so now I have another knob, right? I have a knob that basically says, how much unfairness do I allow? And conditioned on that amount of unfairness, then you optimize the error. And right now, for this model, that knob has to be set at 100%, right? The disparity and false rejection rate is close to 100%. But as I crank that knob down and ask for less and less unfairness, I'm going to change the model, and it'll make the accuracy worse. And this is not some kind of vague conceptual thing. On real data sets, you can actually plot out quantitatively the trade-offs you face between accuracy and unfairness. So I won't go into details, but on three different data sets in which fairness is a concern, one of these is a criminal recidivism data set. Another one is sort of about um, predicting school performance. Um, you know, on the x-axis here, if you could see what the x-axis is, is error, so smaller is better. The y-axis is unfairness, so smaller is better. In a perfect world, we'd be at zero error and zero unfairness. In machine learning in general, on real problems, you're never going to get to zero error, period, okay? But you can see here, like on this plot, there's this trade-off, right? I can, I can minimize my error at this point, but I'll get the worst, the, the maximum unfairness. I can also ask for zero unfairness and I get the worst error, or I can be anywhere in between, okay? And this is sort of where science has to stop and policy has to start. Because people like me can do a very good job at sort of creating the theory and algorithms that result in plots like this. But, to, but, but at some point, somebody or society has to decide like, okay, in this particular application, it's like criminal risk assessment this is the right trade-off between error and unfairness. And in this other application, like gender bias in STEM advertising on Google, this is the right balance between accuracy and fairness. And so at some point, this dialogue has to happen between scientists and policymakers, regulators, legal, and practitioners. Um, but we think that a very good starting point for that dialogue is to make these trade-offs quantitative and really discuss the hard numbers around when you ask for more fairness, how much accuracy are you giving up and vice versa. So what I've just described to you um, roughly, along with the introduction, covers roughly the first half of our book. And our book is meant to be you know, a hopefully engaging, entertaining, general audience, readable treatment of these topics. Um, you know, there's no equations in the book whatsoever. We try to populate it with many real world examples. And, and, but it really covers the first half of the book. So you might wonder, well, what's in the second half of the book? So um, a big part of the second half of the book concerns situations in which algorithms are exhibiting behaviors that we might think of as socially undesirable. But it's not so easy to blame the algorithm exclusively. So in the examples I've been giving so far, you know, it's like you got rejected for a loan or rejected from college even though you deserved to get the loan or get in. You may not even know that an algorithm was making this decision about you. Or you may not even know that your data was used to train the model that is making this decision on other people. So to a first approximation, it really does seem fair to think of algorithms as you know, victimizing individual people. There are a lot of other modern technological settings where there's a, a population of users of an algorithm, or I might say more specifically an app. And the misbehavior is really an emergent phenomenon, not of just the algorithm or app itself, but the incentives and use of that app or algorithm by the entire population. So there are many examples of this. Let me give the cleanest one. The, the cleanest one is um, navigation apps like Google Maps and Waze. You know, so on the one, so you know, these apps clearly are taking all of our collective data, including our real-time GPS coordinates, so they know about real-time traffic on all of the roadways. And you type in, I want to drive from point A to point B, what's the fastest route? Okay, and it's in response, it's not in some abstract way by like looking at a fold out map and saying like, well, this is the minimum distance because that's not what you care about. You want to get from point A to point B the fastest. 
And so on the one hand, like what could be better? Like what could be better than this app that in response to your particular desires right this minute, knowing what everybody else is doing on the roads optimizes your driving route, okay? And trust me, I, I use them every time I drive. But if you step back from this for a second, you might ask the following question. Is it possible that by all of us using these apps that are greedily maximizing self, you know, our own selfish interests, so to use game theoretic language because much of the second half of the book is about settings in which game theory is a valuable tool for thinking, could it be that we're actually all worse off by using these apps? Okay. And you might think, like, well, how could that happen? How could it be that everybody being selfish for themselves results in a collective outcome that's worse for, for you know, many individuals or maybe even the entire population? If you've ever taken a game theory class, probably the first example you were given is Prisoner's Dilemma. And Prisoner's Dilemma is like the canonical, simple game theoretic model in which you know, by everybody being self-interested in optimizing against what everyone else is doing, the outcome for the two players is much, much worse for both of them than it could have been under some alternate non-equilibrium solution, okay? And so, you know, I think a very correct view of these types of apps is that in game theory terms, they are helping all of us compute our best response in a game. And that is driving us towards the competitive or literally the Nash equilibrium of these games if you've taken some, some game theory. And so, and so it, in fact, it is the case that not just on paper, I can, you know, in the book we give a simple mathematical example of where everybody optimizing selfishly for their driving time causes the collective driving time to go up by like, uh, uh, like 33%. And there are actually real instances of this in the world where, um, you know, by, you know, it's related to things like, you know, for, for the, you know, for the locals here, right, you know, um, there was huge concern about closing much of Times Square to vehicular traffic. You know, people are like, oh my God, are you out of your mind? The busiest urban traffic area in the United States, you're going to close that and make it a pedestrian mall? And in fact, it, it's not that bad. In fact, maybe it's even gotten worse. So this is because, like, you know, just because you add capacity to a network of roads or take it away, people react to it in a game theoretic, competitive, or self-interested way. And so you have to think not just about the capacity you've added or taken away, but about the strategic, the, like, wh what the equilibrium behavior that will result from it is. Okay. And so much of the second half of the book is concerned with these kinds of things. And we, we take some liberties in this discussion that I think are not unreasonable. So another domain in which we have all become quite used to personalization or what I would call the kind of algorithmically aided computation of best responses is in social media, right? So there's an algorithm in Facebook's news feed that decides what content to show you, which of your friends' posts to prioritize, what ads to show you, what news or content to show you. And it's like Google Maps in ways. It's learning about your preferences and showing you the stuff that you like. The, the code word for this being, you know, maximizing user engagement, okay? And so these models built by machine learning have discovered that it's better to show you, let's say, political news that you are inclined to agree with than political news that you find offensive or disagreeable. That increases engagement, okay? And again, like Google Maps and Waze, like what could be better? What could be better than instead of my going after have to and like look at a bunch of stuff that I don't like or irrelevant stuff, what could be better than just have an algorithm tell me which route to drive or show me what content? The result, of course, is an equilibrium that we might not like. We might feel like, yes, oh, you know, each individual is having this app personally optimized for them. Maybe this has come at the cost, let's say, not to driving time in the case of Facebook's news feed, but to a deliberative democratic society, for example. And I think many people feel like that is, in fact, what's happened. And what we try to do is kind of put this on slightly firmer scientific footing as kind of thinking about this as a bad equilibrium that results from kind of all of this self-optimization enabled by apps. And we do have algorithmic proposals for these kinds of problems as well. They're a little bit different than just sort of going into the code. But they're not, again, they're, they're things that could be done now. Like as a concrete example, if we don't like the equilibrium that Facebook's current newsfeed algorithm has driven us to, trust me, the way machine learning works is that 
the re by the same reason that Facebook knows what content you like, that same model also tells it what you don't like or what you like slightly less than what you like the most. And it would not take a big change to their code to, you know, do a little bit more exploration and sort of mix into your newsfeed some stuff that you might find less agreeable, okay, or what we might call opposing viewpoints. And they don't have to do this all at once wholesale. They could, in fact, just even offer like a slider bar to individual users that they could experiment with and say like, oh, you know, show me a little bit more stuff that's a little bit further afield than what I agree with. And this might help, you know, the algorithm nudge us out of this bad equilibrium that many people feel like we've gotten into. We also do talk about sort of, you know, things that we think have much longer ways to go scientifically, like interpretability of algorithms, accountability, morality. And we do even talk a little bit about the singularity towards the end, but I'll, I'll uh, leave that unspoken to entice you to go read the book. And so let me stop there and I'll take any questions. We have to make sure that we get her at some point since she. <laughs> I had one question regarding the constraints. Yeah. You said that um, some of these uh, sensitive variables uh, by law cannot be included when we are modeling. And is it OK if you are using them in the constraints then? Um, so. So, so first of all, just to separate two issues, like you know, I basically think these laws are a bad idea. Right. They're, a, they're a bad idea for two reasons, at least two reasons. One is the one that I discussed, which is by sort of you know, refusing the use of race in a predictive model, you might actually be ensuring the disc discrimination against the very group that you were trying to protect by disincluding it. And secondly is you're fooling yourself. Because um, maybe it made sense in the 1970s for credit scoring to forbid the use of race because such limited data was available about people. These days, there are so many proxies for race that I can find in other sources of data. Like, unfortunately, in the United States, for the most part, your zip code is a rather good indicator of your race already as well as like many other things that would surprise you, just like, you know, like what kind of car you drive, whether you're a Mac or a PC user. I'll t like one joke is I, 10 years ago or so, I was at an academic conference. And you know, academics are famous for their liberal politics. And after a few drinks at a dinner, you know, the host said, like, you know, um, I want you to all think, like, do any of you know a Republican that uses a Mac? <laughs> OK. And everybody's kind of absorbed in thought for a minute. And then I, I said, Actually, what everybody's thinking about is whether they know a Republican first. <laughs> and then they'll think about whether they know a Mac. But like, I'm joking, but the point is, is that right, you know, a lot of apparently innocuous attributes about you that you don't even think are particularly sensitive can be very correlated statistically with things like race or even other things that you might not even know about yourself. Right. And so like, I, I think that these kind of you know, get fairness by forbidding the use of certain features is a losing proposition and that the right alternative is to say, like, you know, use any data that you want, don't racially discriminate. Okay? Or don't, you know, and and that's the right solution, not trying to get to it kind of indirectly by kind of, you know, assuming that the models work a certain way and that if you don't give them certain information that they can't discriminate. Because that that's just proven to be a flawed way of thinking, especially in kind of the modern data rich era. Thanks. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Thank you. I'm still like, you know. <laughs> um, so with nanotechnology kind of really increasing the velocity of computation and um, uh, the existence of both good actors and bad actors, how, how, how from an ethical point of view, um, can the um, the influence, because it might be very hard to undo something when it's happening at nano speed. H how, how do we navigate this, this kind of territory of, of Yeah. Things? I mean, I don't think I have a general answer to kind of the, you know, what we might think of as like the computational arms race. Mm. Um, I think that arms race is being played out in many domains, um, you know, so 
in particular, computer security has this kind of flavor all the time, right? It's like, you know, in computer security, you're, you try to anticipate all of the ways in which hackers might breach your system or your data. Um, but they have the luxury of figuring out your vulnerabilities and the things that you didn't think about in getting you there, okay? And so I think that that area, you know, um, the more data you have, the more compute power you have, um, that all helps. But at the end of the day, the thing is fundamentally some kind of game between two players. And it's, the, the game is harder to be the defender than the attacker, right? Because it's kind of like a universal versus an existential quantifier. The, the defender has to think to protect against everything. The attacker just has to find the one thing that you didn't think of, OK? Um, so, but I do think like one concrete example where I think things do need to change is in the regulatory approach to tech companies. So to the extent that large regulatory agents in, these, in the US want to get serious about you know, preventing the kinds of harms that, I'm discuss that we discuss in the book on users. Um, I think we are in a very flawed state right now where the regulatory agencies, first of all, you know, in their defense, have very strong limitations on what they can and can't do right now. And they're basically at a great disadvantage to the big tech companies. So, you know, people think of it as like a big win for the regulatory community when Facebook has to pay a huge fine for severe privacy violations. And then the main remedy to that going forward is like, you know, you need to fix your internal processes and people. Like imagine an alternative world where like the FTC or the DOJ or what have you actually is allowed internal access to the systems, data, and algorithms of a company like Facebook and can sort of find misdeeds, you know, before they have widespread damage. So this is going to require legal and regulatory change. Tech companies are going to be resistant to it. But there's nothing conceptual about it that's difficult, right? Um, you know, if an algorithm is exhibiting racial, gender, or other discrimination, there's a way of auditing those algorithms and discovering that with not great difficulty. And you know, why not let the regulatory agencies have that access rather than waiting until there's some, you know, the, the media or some other hacker group has to expose a flaw, and then there's like a big fine and sort of procedural change. Um, and so I think that's an area where I'm not sure, you know, about nanotechnology per se, but like this arms race, you know, this this battle between two opposing parties. There's concrete ways you could level that playing field, I think, in very productive ways. And I, you know, this is a longer conversation, but I also don't really buy the argument that this would infringe severely on the intellectual property of the kind of technology companies. I think it could be done in a way that lets them have their intellectual property, um, but provides much greater consumer protections. So that would be the same idea of the defender and the attacker. Yeah. At, at, at Regulatory level, they'd be the attacker, so it's if they're able to go in. Yeah, or maybe attack. I wouldn't call it attacker and defender. I would call it like you know an auditor. Oh, that's yeah. fine. Whatever. Yeah. But I understand the dynamic. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, you've been uh, waiting a while. Uh, Parveen Singh, Carnegie New Leaders. Um, so there's a big, been a big conversation on the West Coast with uh, Uber, Lyft um, about shared mobility and the data uh, that Uber and Lyft and Waze collects being given to city and municipal governments. As a New Yorker, we would love to have you know data-driven technology in our trans uh, transit system. Um, I want to get your perspective on what you think about city and local governments having access to the data that private companies collect um, for their transit systems. Um, you know, I'm, I'm generally a great believer in any socially good use of data, provided, you know, there are protections against the kinds of things that I describe here. You know, so um, I think it would be great if Uber and Lyft wanted to share their data with, you know, um, urban municipalities in order to prove, improve public transit or mobility. Um, you have to also be concerned about the privacy of the individual data that Uber and Lyft collect being shared with a wider set of people. You might already worry about them just having it in the first place. But I mean, you know, so, but, but in general, I'm, I'm very much in favor of that kind of effort. It just has to be kind of managed and negotiated in a way that kind of doesn't, you know, that again, like kind of balances the trade off between the good that's caused and the potential harms. And, um, you know, a lot of those types of things, I think, are negotiations that need to happen on the policy side and maybe are less 
technical than some of the more limited um, problems that we're kind of discussing in the book, but I think it's all on the same spectrum. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the ethics in terms of collaborating and teaching techniques, advanced techniques to people that are developing AI systems that don't incorporate these ethical elements, that are only concerned with optimization, and whether or not there's a trend within the academic world or the world more broadly to try to make sure that people are only collaborating with people that incorporate these. And I'm thinking specifically in terms of international relations related to Chinese efforts to use AI to identify potential nodes of dissent and sort of how that's shifting. Yeah, so, you know, I don't have any special insight into kind of, you know, Chinese governmental use of data. You know, my view of probably it is no more informed than many people in this room, but it, you know, it doesn't look good, right? I mean, it doesn't look good to have one party setting policy with unfettered access, you know. Like, if we worry about the United States being a surveillance state, I think, you know, there it's pretty much an open, you know, not even an open secret, it's just open that, that, that it is. Um, you, you know, so, um, I, don't, I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't have a lot to say about China in particular. Um, I, I do think that, um, you know, the, the use of, you know, things like social media data to identify, um, you know, dissident groups um, and to use it for political purposes or to, you know, disadvantage or harm your enemies is kind of the opposite of the kinds of applications that he was discussing over there. And so, you know, could, should be disallowed, basically. Um, and, you know, we've had our own versions of these things, or at least claims of our own versions of these things in the United States um, that, that, again, seem small in comparison to places where, you know, that kind of data is used to really harm people physically. Um, but, but I think it's, again, you know, you don't want to walk down that, that slope at all. So, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't like the use of people's social media data to target um, political misinformation at them to the extent that that's happening. I think these are all bad uses of algorithms and machine learning. Thank you so much for your lecture and uh, I really enjoyed it. I think my question is a little similar. So I, uh, I work for an organization. Uh, we are part of a coalition, global coalition called Campaign to Stop Kira Robots. So in essence, we uh, advocate for international law to prohibit uh, development of fully autonomous weapons, which basically means that any weapon system that can deploy force uh, uh, without meaningful human control. So just wondered, you know, on behalf of the campaign, if you had any thoughts about use of algorithm in weapon system or even in law enforcement. Yeah, um, I, you know, we, we talked very briefly about this in the last chapter of the book, and let me use your example to sort of more generally ask the question that I think people individually need to think about and society as a whole needs to think about is like, are there certain types of decisions that we just don't want algorithms to make or certain types of things that we don't want algorithms to do? Not, not even because of the problems that I'm identifying here, which is that they do them badly in some way or another, but even if they did them perfectly, we don't want them to do it because um, of the moral character involved. Like, you know, and, and um, we, we reference in this part of the book, this great um, book by Michael Sandel, who's a well-known ethicist at, at uh, Harvard University. And he's kind of the source of these like trolley car thought experiments where like, you know, you know what would you do? Which should the car turn and kill the passenger or kill the, the, the school kids? But he has a great book called, you know, What Money Can't Buy. And, um, and I was very influenced by his book in writing our book because in his, his book is about economics. And his book is about kind of the rise of ap economic and market-based thinking after World War II and the gradual creep of markets into things that he really morally doesn't think should be markets at all, okay? And he points out that sometimes when you make a market out of something, it changes the nature of the good being sold, right? And so, I was very influenced by that because I felt like in many places in his book you could swap out the word markets for algorithms and you know 
uh, things that shouldn't be sold to uh, for algorithms that shouldn't decisions algorithms shouldn't make, and it would make sense. And I think automated warfare is a good one, right? Even if you know hypothetically algorithms could make perfectly targeted drone strikes with no collateral damage whatsoever, um, in an autonomous, unsupervised, no human in the loop fashion, um, maybe we think that shouldn't be done just because only a human being can sort of accept the moral agency or responsibility of the decision to kill another human being in a way that an algorithm just can't. So even if it makes the decision perfectly, you change the moral character of the decision by having an algorithm make it. And I definitely agree there are domains, and I think I would personally count for myself automated warfare as one where I would want to tread extremely carefully, even if algorithms are much better than, than kind of human actors. Um, so I, I think I agree with the mission that you describe. Thank you so much. Yeah, you've been waiting a while. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds good. So there are people asking questions in the audience. Sure. Thank you again. I uh, just wanted to ask. By the title of your book, it seems like the ethical algorithm might exist, or at least that's what you're arguing. Um, and I'm curious, it's mentioned that like fairness, for example, could be like gained, I guess, in these algorithms by introducing multiple constraints. But privacy could be considered like an additional constraint. And then when you go on to list the others, the more and more we introduce constraints into this kind of optimization problem, you, there's going to be some utility trade-off, as mentioned. And so what evidence, I guess, have you seen in your research that uh, would lend itself to say that like even as, as many constraints as we can think of in terms of like, <coughs> formulating morality into an algorithm, uh, how can we still get something that works and provides value? Okay, so you want me to just like take the other two quickly and I'll, 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 yeah, I'll answer them. This one I have a quick answer to, but let's just take them all. Uh, uh, so quick question. I have a question about privacy and fairness. So one of the things you mentioned is that uh, fairness might require knowing the variables like race or gender to make sure that the algorithm is unfair. Uh, fair. Uh, do you think that could be an odds to the privacy because privacy, the user may not want to reveal those variables in the first place. So what do you think about that? So let me just take, I think these two questions are extremely similar, so let me just take them and then I'll take hers as the last one. So, so basically, the more constraints you add, the more trade-offs there are. If you ask for more fairness, you might get less accuracy. If you ask for more fairness, you might get less privacy. If you ask for more fairness of one type, you might get less for another. If you ask for all of these things simultaneously, you might not be able to do anything useful with data. And that's the reality, OK? So um, you know, when, I say, when we say the ethical algorithm, we're not suggesting that there's going to be some master algorithm which encodes all of the social norms we might care about into a single algorithm that's still useful for anything. I don't think that thing exists. That's why I think you know, science can take us to the point of making these trade-offs explicit and quantitative. And then the real, you know, then society and you know in the you know in the abstract and stakeholders in particular problems they're going to have to navigate which of these norms they really care about and how much and make those trade-offs and and hope that you know there is still something useful to do with algorithms and data um, once they've specified their constraints thank you thank you hi i just wanted to segue into policy a little bit what do we do when we're, for example, with Jonathan Haidt's Foundations of Morality, we've seen that there are very different ways that different cultures interpret morality, fairness, even privacy to a certain degree. I was wondering, how do we think about social norms and policies that can be applied on a, on a larger scale globally, where we can actually try to come up with some sort of a social norm on anything, be it on privacy, on fairness, that is applicable culturally, sort of on a global scale? OK, so that's a great question. And we talk very briefly about this kind of thing. Um, and it really is true that, especially in fairness, where there are multiple different definitions that are in competition with each other, each of these definitions is, in some sense, kind of like received wisdom. Like, who decides what group should be protected and what would constitute harm to that group? And that might mean something very different in one culture or another culture. Or it might even mean something different to different people, right? So as far as I can tell, there's very little known just about ordinary people's subjective notions of privacy or fairness. You know, there's very little 
behavioral work on this kind of thing where you, you know, and we did a little bit, you know, just um, in a mini project at Penn back in the spring where, you know, we showed subjects pairs of criminal records from the Compass data set and said, you know, do you think these two individuals are sufficiently similar that they should be treated, you know, they should be assessed to have similar risk of, let's say, recommitting a violent crime? And you know, um, we still haven't really grokked the data in detail yet. But the you know, the the first thing you realize in this data is that different people have different opinions on this, right? And 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 different people have you know, just in this kind of pairwise assessment task, um, some people have you know, very restrictive notions of fairness that would cost a lot to accuracy if you implemented their fairness notions, and other people are more liberal, and you could build more accurate models and still satisfy their subjective notion. And, and so you know, I think this line of work is basically absent in the literature that we're describing in this book right now, and um, because we're trying to talk about the science. But to do science on this, we have to know, first of all, what different cultures would think constitutes fairness or privacy and how it differs across different cultures. And um, you know, while I'm interested in doing this kind of research, you know, I'm not a social scientist by training, and I think we need more social scientists by training doing this kind of work in multiple cultures and across multiple demographic groups and the like. So I think it's um, a pretty wide open uh, landscape for this kind of stuff. But I think it's going to be increasingly important because I think, you know, especially once these received wisdom fairness notions prove to really be costing you in other dimensions, then people are going to look hard at them and say, like, hey, wait, who says this is the group to protect and that this is what constitutes harm to them? And I don't think there are great answers to that question. Thanks. OK, thank you, everybody. I appreciate your coming out. <laughs>